I'm uh, Frederick Gex. Uh, I teach uh, constitutional law and philosophy of law at Brigham Young University Law School and published some in uh, <coughs> the area of uh, freedom of religion generally and um, religious accommodations. I'm very pleased to be part of, um, of this conference, which is organi organized by uh, my very old and treasured friend, Rod Smith, and uh, especially a conference that honors Doug Laycock, whom I've known uh, almost as long as Rod, and, and whose principal dedication to the work of religious freedom uh, I very much admire and respect, even though I often disagree with Doug. Uh, I'm also pleased to participate on this panel with uh, Richard Caskey, Gene Scher, and Robin Wilson, all of whom have also devoted a lot of time and thought to the complex problem of religious accommodation. It's become clear that the principal ground of conflict in the culture wars has shifted. Religious conservatives who once sought to block or overturn laws they find morally objectionable are now more likely to let such laws stand and pursue exemptions from them instead. A religious exemption excuses a believer from obeying a law that interferes with her exercise of religion, while the law continues to bind everyone else. The Hobby Lobby case was about this kind of exemption, and the Supreme Court's recognition of LGBT access to civil marriage has greatly multiplied religious exemption claims since that case was decided in 2015. Public discourse on religious exemptions suffers in many ways, but I think especially two. First, I think there's a persistent failure of what we might call civic reciprocity, by which I mean an inability or a refusal to recognize what is legitimately at stake for those on the other side of an accommodation issue. So accommodationists, for example, rarely admit that fully exempting uh, say nonprofit religious employers from the Affordable Care Act contraception mandate would generate financial hardship for many of uh, the nonprofit's employees who, who would then have to pay for contraceptives and related medical services out of their after-tax wages because they're not covered by insurance. And separationists opposed to such exemptions often refuse to acknowledge the serious moral dilemma that uh, the mandate imposes on many nonprofit religious employers who must choose between the law and their faith with dire consequences no matter uh, which uh, one they choose. Public discourse on religious accommodation also generally ignores the place uh, where accommodation is sought. Accommodations are discussed as if they promote or threaten the same values regardless of the place they're implemented. So denial of accommodation to a government official or a retail commercial business is taken as a decision that churches or synagogues uh, also shouldn't be com uh, uh, accommodated or won't be accommodated in staffing religious decisions. So like any good academic at a conference, I have come armed with a solution. I will suggest how uh, Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative helps consistent principle thinking about religious exemptions and accommodations, and I'll provide a classification of the different sites of accommodation that illuminates, I think, proper accommodation balances. And I'll close with two examples of my approach, although, depending on the time, <coughs> maybe only one example. Uh, most people um, know Kant's categorical imperative as the injunction to always treat people as ends in themselves and never solely as means to one's own ends. Late in his life, uh, Kant adapted the categorical imperative into a principle of natural right. Any action is right, he argued, if it can coexist with everyone else's external freedom as a universal law without contradicting itself. So in short, I have a natural right to do anything, provided that others could exercise this same right. So how would this work? Um, if you study Kant, you know that he is hopelessly complicated and philosophers are still arguing more than two centuries later about what he really meant. But there are at least a couple of simple examples. So I could choose a goal as a goal for myself 
um, that's analytically contradictory. I could decide that I will um, care for others first at the same time that I prioritize my own interests, and, and that's just uh, a definitional contradiction. Uh, another example presents what we could call an operational contradiction. So suppose I need money, and uh, I really need a loan from the bank, but I know that my income and assets um, won't qualify me for the loan, so I lie about them. Um, this was actually our mortgage system 10 years ago. Uh, uh, I lie about them, and, and my maxim or my rule of behavior is uh, I may lie about my finances in order to get the money that I need. If we universalize this rule, it would state that everyone may lie in order to get the money they need. But of course, if everyone lies on their loan applications, banks, they may be slow, but they'll eventually pick up that uh, promises to repay are worthless and they'll stop lending money. That's a contradiction in the operation of that universalized rule. Uh, it makes it impossible for me or anyone else to obtain the end of getting money for which uh, the rule was adopted in the first place. Now the importance of place is implicit in the contradiction limit that Kant places on maxims or rules of behavior that conform to his principles of natural right. While it would be incoherent to act according to a rule of always helping others while prioritizing uh, my own interests, it's not at all contradictory if I divide the world into two spheres of action, one for each uh, part of this rule. So I will put others first in my family and in my church, but I'll prioritize, prioritize my own interests at work. With that in mind, uh, I suggest a classification of five sites of, accom of accommodation. Now we've come to the moment of decision. Will this work? Okay, it does. Uh, five sites of accommodation. Churches, synagogues, mosques, and other houses of worship. Religious nonprofit entities and activities. Public accommodations such as for-profit retail establishments which hold themselves out open to the public for profit, private for-profit housing and employment, and then lastly, at the periphery, government offices and officials. So as the slide indicates, the background principle at work here is the public-private public, uh, distinction. Activities at the center of the slide are quintessentially, um, got this backward, quintessentially private, while those at the periphery are quintessentially public. Those in between are hybrids of public and private. The basic principle is, is straightforward. If, if you're in my living room, I can ask you to take off your shoes. I actually visit a family from my church, and that's their rule. I have to take off my shoes every time I visit them. Or I can tell you not to smoke, or I can decide I don't want you in my house at all, and I can even make that decision on blameworthy decisions like racial or religious animus because this is my private space where public values are presumptively inapplicable. But if I'm a, a government official running a government office, uh, I can ask you to take off your shoes before coming into the office. I can't tell you not to smoke unless there's a law. I could tell you not to smoke if there's a law against smoking in the office, but not because I feel like it. Um, I can't exercise racial or gender discrimination. So what about someone like Kim Davis, the county clerk in Kentucky um, a year or two ago who declared that issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples made her complicit in what she believes is the evil counterfeit of divine heterosexual marriage? Her maxim would presumably be something like, I may refuse to issue marriage licenses to couples whose legal union would violate my religious beliefs, even though issuing such licenses forms part of my official government duties. So if we universalize that, the maxim would be something like, any government official may refuse to perform any of her official government duties for particular persons if doing so would conflict with her religion. Does this maxim contradict itself? Uh, I think it does. Uh, at least it contradicts any legitimate reason for holding public office. Now. Um, 
I don't want to be naive here. People seek government office for a variety of reasons, many of which are not to serve the people. But the legitimate reason for seeking public office is, in fact, to serve the people. And officials at every level of government take an oath to observe the Constitution and laws of the United States and the jurisdiction where they serve and to use their office for public and not personal benefit. Those who serve the people undertake to serve all of the people. So a maxim that allows a government official to pick and choose which of the people she's willing to serve is holding office in contradiction of the most legitimate reason for holding office. Government officials who can't fulfill the duties of their office for all of the people because of religious beliefs, I believe should resign, not seek exemptions. Now what about the other extreme in the middle here? Uh, uh, religious exemptions for an actual church. A few years ago, the Supreme Court exempted churches, synagogues, and other houses of worship from employment discrimination laws. So when a co religious congregation hires or fires a ministerial employee, such as a pastor or a rabbi or another congregational leader, it is categorically exempt from laws that prohibit discrimination in employment. So universalized maxim would be a religious congregation may violate laws prohibiting racial, gender, ethnic, LGP and any other kind of discrimination when it chooses its congregational leader. Is there a contradiction in that maxim? Well, there might be a theological one, depending on, on the church or the synagogue or the mosque, but not a Kantian one. Churches are like living rooms. They're presumptively private spaces in which private values presumptively control. Can we imagine a coherent principled system of government which allows exemptions like this? which enable discrimination in this kind of private space. I think we can, so long as the discrimination is limited to that private space, to that religious voluntary association, like a church, uh, which lacks government power and whose force is confined to the private life of the church and its members. I think, indeed, some principle like this is, necess is a necessary condition for religious and other sorts of moral pluralisms but um, my 15 minutes is up if I haven't already exceeded it, so I'll leave that story for another day. Thank you.